A recent movie acquainted millions of Americans with the name of Baroness, a Danish Baroness Blixen, whose pen name was Isaac Dennison. The movie was Out of Africa. And this semi-autobiographical book was written back in 1938. Four years earlier, Isaac Dennison published a book of seven short novels or long short stories. The book was called Seven Gothic Tales. I recommend it for entertainment. One of them was mainly the reminiscences of a couple of old gentlemen in Paris, in the Paris of a couple of generations ago. Within that story, there was a little story involving an Armenian organ grinder. Now, most of you, you younger ones, will not know what an organ grinder was or ever had occasion to see and hear one. I do recall as a little child seeing an organ grinder. This was a fellow in a kind of a gypsy outfit, a colorful outfit. His organ was about this size. It was somewhat heavy, therefore there was a pole under it on which the organ could stand. It was a leather thong that he slung over his back and carried this organ around on his back. Uh, touring the neighborhoods of some of the eastern cities, he would stop and crank up this organ. A uh, little crowd would assemble before the days of radio or television or maybe even phonographs. Uh, the organ grinder always had a little monkey, and the monkey had a pillbox hat strap under his chin, a little outfit as colorful as his master, and the little fellow would pass among the crowd with a cup, collect coins, and bring the coins back to his master, and then repeat this in different neighborhoods. As will happen, the old Armenian eventually died. The little monkey was, I'm sorry, in addition to this uh, trick of uh, collecting coins, this Armenian had taught uh, the little monkey a whole series of other tricks which the monkey would perform at a word of command in Armenian. Well, the old man died. The monkey was taken over by a friendly, kindly French couple who fed him the proper foods, who kept him housed warmly. But nevertheless, the poor little fellow began to languish. He had all of these little tricks locked up inside of him, and no one knew Armenian so as to be, enable him to perform the tricks uh, which stayed potential and never became actual. I don't know, but I assume that Isaac Dennison told this little monkey story as sort of a parable of the human condition, that we are creatures with enormous potential. And these potentials are within us. Only a few people seem able to bring them out. Now, to translate this parable, and you get the idea that in human beings there are all kinds of potential, potentials unlimited, but they become actual only by being touched with a magic wand from outside the uh, magic wand called education. Now, as to variety, people come in all sizes, shapes, colors, and so on, and with all sorts of divergent talents. We had a seminar in Macon, Georgia, about a dozen years ago. Uh, I was seated in a row next to the end over there, a couple of seats in. It was Saturday morning. A fellow who hadn't been there the night before came in, sat down beside me a man, I would say, about five feet six. I mean, five feet six wide. He was about five feet six tall also. Now, within the, this keg-like human being, there was packed something like 330 pounds of solid muscle and sinew. This was Paul Anderson, the world's strongest man. One of his records still stands in a specially constructed platform with a harness over his shoulders and back, Paul Anderson lifted 6,200 pounds. Other people develop other talents. Rubinstein, the pianist, could play for hours from memory. 
actors can recite yards of poetry from memory. About 10 years ago, on the Broadway stage, there was a British actor who recited the entire Gospel of Mark. Other biblical buffs learn most of the whole Bible by heart. There are people who perform prodigies of thought and invention. You might say, to use the jargon of the space scientists, there is redundancy built into us. Redundancy, more backup equipment than any of us will ever use. Uh, during the course of a lifetime, if we draw on a fraction of it, we're doing well. The scholastic curriculum labeled liberal arts education emerged, developed, and grew in the course of centuries in order to give the young people of successive generations the tools of learning, tools which they could then use to free themselves from ignorance, taboos, obstructions, other hindrances which would prevent them from becoming the kind of people they had it in them to be. In other words, the liberal arts are the liberating arts. That is, they freed the individual person from all that prevented him from fulfilling his potentialities. The ultimate goal of a liberal arts education is understanding and wisdom, meaning by these terms a broader and deeper understanding of human nature, human destiny, and also, we are provided with a few clues as to some of the important purposes of our earthly pilgrimage. In other words, education is ends-oriented, ends-oriented. Its primary tools are language, literature, philosophy, history, and mathematics. Education is not the same as training. I have passed out to you, or it's in your little folder, thing called Knock on Education. Albert J. Knock, in whom Clayton and I are mutually interested and implicated, was the editor of the Freeman from 1920 to 1924. American essayist, belletrist, and my office in uh, New York is the cosmic headquarters of the Knockian Society. On our masthead we say, no offices, no dues, no meetings. So it's the next best thing to no society at all, but we have fun. My secretary of 14 years, Marion Schubert Norell, wrote this little gem of a piece, Knock on Education. Knock makes a great distinction between education and training, and I shall dent that distinction somewhat, thinking myself that Knock went a little bit too far. But anyway, here is a, a brilliant disquisition on the distinction. A bonus on the other side, this was an issue of a paper called Fragments Devoted to Knock, a piece that I put together. You'll also find a bibliography that I put together specifically for this morning of uh, books that have meant a lot to me and do mean a lot to me. Some familiar, only three, I think. The rest, relatively unknown. But look them up. In, conne in connection with part of that, an old bibliography by Gerald Hurd. The first section deals with Invention in the Mathematical Field by Hadamard and uh, Science and Hypothesis by a second great mathematician. Plus, I recommend an anthology on the creative process. You'll find it in your folders. Education is not the same as training. Training deals with technique, that is, with how-to knowledge. Training deals with means, in contrast to education, which deals with ends. Obviously, the world could not continue without the help it gets from millions of trained men and women who do the world's work. The scientists, inventors, entrepreneurs, engineers, the doctors, dentists, nurses, manufacturers, managers, and so on. These are trained people. We need them. If one were asked to, to name an example of the trained man, he would say someone like Edison. 
Edison's kind of genius has given us invention which have transformed life in our time in many beneficial ways. Our life is cleaner, brighter, healthier, more convenient, and much noisier because men like Edison have lived and worked. We have many more things. Gadgetry overwhelms us. Well, almost everybody will acknowledge the importance of the trained people in our midst and the benefits of what they have given us. They keep our society going and they make it better. They have enormously increased the power of our means. But what about the people who are schooled merely in the liberating arts? What can they do for us? If students who have been exposed to the very best that has been thought and said about our species over the centuries, if they have acquired some understanding of what it means to be a person, a man and a woman, some understanding of the basic nature and destiny proper to a human being, well, if such people are then heeded by those who possess power and training and know-how, then we might possibly scrape together sufficient wisdom to save our society from the detonation of its incredibly powerful means. <clears throat> it does seem to be our fate to live at a time in history when enormous power is, our, at, power is at our disposal, but not wholly under our control. Ideas still rule in human affairs, and we won't know what to do with our newly acquired power unless we know what to do with our lives. And that is where the liberating arts come in. For it's a main function of the liberal arts education to help us face up to the question of how to make our lives count for the things that really matter. Well, that's a brief distinction between education and training. Let me also emphasize that education and schooling are two radically different things. No society before our own has ever put so much faith in schooling, which we usually mislabel education. Virtually no child in America lives beyond the reach of some public school, and every child's exposure to the public school is compulsory. Look back a few generations when schooling at the college level, and even the high school level, was thought to be a rare privilege. But now there are as many local community colleges as there once were local high schools with about the same standards. And of course, the college population, the college population has exploded in the past couple of decades. We, we as a nation, we proudly point to this system of schooling, schools and colleges, as our educational establishment, when it is no such thing. Now, education does rarely occur within the schooling system but by accident. For it is uh, rather rare to find a student in any of our schools who is genuinely educable. In one of Will Durant's early books, he tells the story about a foreign student who came here to do some graduate work at one of our great universities. After a year or two or three, the young man went back to his native country with a parting shot to someone. He said that American universities are really athletic institutions with opportunities for study for the feeble-bodied. <laughs> well, my remark of a moment ago that only the occasional student is educable sounds snobbish and elitist, but it wouldn't have sounded snobbish if I had said uh, that the occasional educable student is a bookworm. It's a fact. Liberal arts education is primarily directed at bookworms, and it's the kids who are fascinated by the printed page. The liberal arts scholar frequents the library, not the laboratory. 
he gets his education, by and large, by studying the books and the papers of other scholars. And a liberal arts scholar is the type who does quite well in the standard Stanford Binet IQ test. I'd like to point out that what is measured by the typical IQ test measures only one kind of intelligence, and there are other kinds of intelligence that that test does not measure. Years ago, I was studying in Berkeley at the Pacific School of Religion, and our psychology professor was the head of the Department of Psychology at Berkeley, at UCAL. And of course, he had to expose uh, the theological student to an IQ test. Well, as a matter of fact, we did reasonably well. Our average was just over 130 compared to the average at the graduate schools in University of California of about 120. Now, does that mean that we were smarter than the students at UCAL? Not at all. It means simply that we had a different kind of smartness than the graduate students in physics, chemistry, geology, astronomy, or one of the other sciences. Our fort was book learning. Theirs was of a different species. I think the modern world has, in its educational sector, has suffered unduly from its failure to understand important distinctions in this area of schooling, and because we have greatly overvalued what the IQ test might do, and hence have focused on liberal arts programs, not realizing that they are not for everyone. We began this system of compulsory instruction and schooling about 150 years ago in this country. Apparently, the people who were involved in this with the centuries, centuries old liberal arts curriculum, they geared this new school system into the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, which was a system well adapted to bookworms. It prepared these kids to enter one of our liberal arts colleges. Uh, there weren't many other kinds of colleges in those days. But the system of instruction set up was not well adapted to the youngsters whose intelligences ran in other directions than book learning. That is, in the direction of vocational and technical training. Therefore, school for them had to be a very frustrating experience. Come down to the period after World War II, still very fresh in our memories, when someone decided that everyone ought to have a college education. There was a vast increase in the number of colleges, and the college population exploded. Teachers in great numbers had to be hauled in. And it happens to be a fact that not many men and women in one generation have a genuine vocation for teaching. So many teachers were professing who didn't quite like what they were doing and didn't have any dedication to it. Of course, trouble came. And it turned many campuses into what resembled battlefields. Yesterday, you may recall, was the 20th anniversary of the uprising at Columbia. And of course, it was on television yesterday morning. I'm losing track of the days. Maybe it was Thursday morning. Uh, the show had Mark Rudd 20 years ago haranguing the student body, and Mark Rudd today, a little more mature man, but still working the same field. Our first mistake was to set up a system of compulsory public instruction, and then to compound this error by our failure to recognize the important distinction between education and training. Complex modern society needs a great diversity of talents, and not, to repeat, not all talented people, by any means, are good material for a liberal arts education. As a matter of fact, any society can absorb a certain number of uh, doctorates in the liberal arts, but not many. Too many liberal arts doctors can wreck a society or ruin it. But, on the other hand, no society can have too many honest artisans and craftsmen. 
butchers, bakers, candlestick makers, and all the rest. Obviously, the head is important, but the hands are important too. And more important is a proper balance between head and hands. More than a hundred years ago, this lack of balance in the American educational system, so-called, was pointed out by Ernest Renan, the famous French author and critic. Here is his warning. Countries which, like the United States, have set up considerable popular instruction without any serious higher education, the liberal arts, will long have to expiate the error of their ways by their intellectual mediocrity, the vulgarity of their manners, their superficial spirit, their failure in general intelligence. As old Andrew Jackson said in another uh, situation with reference to the country from which Mr. Renan came, I know them French. <laughs> and he didn't trust them. Anyway, every one of us has met people of unlimited energy, bursting with enthusiasm, full of ideas which sound plausible, but whose projects always seem to fizzle out without ever getting anywhere. I knew such a man once years ago, a man named Norman Lombard. Uh, he had written a book which was widely discussed back in the early 1930s, a book on monetary reform. And since that time, he had initiated numerous plans for saving the world, and the world persistently refused his offers. I was discussing Norman with a friend some years later, and I wondered aloud why he never got off the ground with his project. And my friend said, trouble with him is he got his gear shaft installed before his steering wheel. Well, back to liberal education. It's a prime function of a liberal education to provide people or a society with a steering wheel, the equivalent, the moral equivalent of a steering wheel, and possibly a map as well. A bishop of the early church said somewhat the same thing when he declared that we need three types of men, those who work, those who fight, and those who pray. In other words, we need someone who's going to grow the potatoes. We need someone to protect the producer against the marauders. And we need someone who has some insight into the deeper nature of things so we will know why we are growing potatoes and why we want to protect the way of life that we have chosen. Every society needs some people who remind us continuously that there is more to life than merely taking care of our creaturely needs, important as that is. Man, women too, man in the generic sense, has a spiritual and moral nature whose hungers are as real as his physical appetites. Human life has meanings which far transcend the material comfort or even physical survival that most of us enjoy today. And further, we will not resolve our material and social problems until we absorb those meanings which are keys to life and act upon the implications. Which means that scholarship has a relevance far beyond scholarship itself. The tradition of Western learning, this liberal arts curriculum, goes back to at least Plato or Socrates. Plato, or the man whose mouthpiece he was, Socrates, these two men laid down the lines upon which Western education has proceeded from that day till almost this day. This body of thought goes back then about two and a half thousand years. It's been called the grand, old, fortifying, classical curriculum. It's like the Gulf Stream, which courses through the Atlantic as it comes down to us, this stream of thought, touching generations throughout the ages, and at a given time, affecting 
and involving only a handful of people. Emerson observed that there are not in the world at any given time more than a dozen persons who read and understand Plato, never enough to pay for an edition of his works. Yet to every generation, these works come down for the sake of these few persons, because they are the little leaven that affects the whole loaf. The custodian of this intellectual treasure of the past two and a half millennia had been the colleges and the universities. Every college in the American continent partook of this heritage, beginning with our first university or college, Harvard, dating back to 1836. A fellow named John Harvard, an eminent English divine, came over here to the Bay Colony in 1635. He was involved immediately in setting up this new projected college, and he donated to it one half of his estate, which came to about 800 pounds, a sizable chunk of dough in those days. The uh, beginning of the Harvard Library was his own 320-book library. Again, a pretty sizable collection of books for that period. And of course, then we named the college after him. William Bradford of uh, Plymouth Plantation fame traces Harvard's line of descent. Cambridge, Massachusetts was then called Newtown. So he writes, a light was kindled in Newtown in the Bay Colony in 1636. But the spark that touched it off came from a lamp of learning lighted first by the ancient Greeks, tended by the church during the Dark Ages, blown white and high in the medieval universities, handed down to us in direct line through Paris, the University of Paris, Paris, Oxford, and Cambridge, to Cambridge, Massachusetts. Harvard College was supposed to be a duplicate of Emmanuel College, the most Puritan of the Cambridge, England University. It's where John Harvard earned his Master of Arts degree. And the Harvard curriculum was the liberal arts educational scheme, which was the educational scheme of our Western liberal arts heritage. About 130 years ago, Cardinal John Henry Newman paid an eloquent tribute to Western civilization and its educational counterpart. The nature of Western civilization is such, he said, that to all intents and purposes, Western civilization and civilization are equivalent terms. Let me state this in the Cardinal's own words. Though there are other civilizations in the world, as there are other societies, yet this civilization, together with the society which is its creation and its home, is so distinctive and luminous in character, so imperial in its extent, so imposing in its duration, and so utterly without rival upon the face of the earth, that the association may fitly assume to itself the title of human society, and its civilization the abstract term civilization. I'll quarrel with that a bit later on. This was a lecture that he gave in Dublin in 1858, a time when England was at the height of her powers, when England had supreme prestige and self-confidence, Britannia ruled the world. England's colonies were on every continent, leading to the proud declaration that the sun never sets on the British flag. The English gentleman was the model of the human male. Uh, English was the universal language. The great philosopher George Santayana wrote, the world will never again have so boyish a master. 
Well, much has happened since Newman's day to change that picture that he painted in such glowing colors. We now know that high levels of civilization were attained in Africa, in India, and China. Thousands of years ago, long before we ever heard, anybody ever heard of Greece and Rome, these civilizations had come and gone, or partly gone. So civilization, we now know, is not simply a European thing. But note that it was through the work of European scholars that the people of the Orient and people of Egypt got to know about their ancient glories. The people of India, for example, had lost contact with the Upanishads and the Mahabharata and the Vedas. These were discovered or rediscovered by English-speaking scholars who translated the Sanskrit into English so that Hindu scholars could read their original scriptures not in their own language, but in English. The growing awareness of ancient civilizations upset the idea that the great culture, the great civilization that spanned the time from Homer down to almost the present, the Victorian age, it, had, it made us discard that notion that that was the only civilization known to man. And this new knowledge has caused many Europeans to have a keener perception of the defects of our civilization. Besides, in the Victorian age, the English were getting somewhat weary of bearing the white man's burden, and also the natives were getting restless. Herbert Spencer, turn of the century, writing a letter to Grant Allen, prophesied gloomily that he foresaw in Europe a period of rebarbarization coming. But it was World War I that really stunned the Western world and opened the eyes of the rest of the world. It proved to the rest of mankind that Western world hegemony was but a shadow, not substance. The statesmen of Western European nations in the early part of this century played their dangerous games completely lacking in the kind of foresight which wiser statesmen might have employed to figure out where the trends they were setting in motion would finally explode. A man named Nielsen Francis Nielsen resigned from Parliament in 1914 to write a book, or to publish a book, called How Diplomats Make War. Nixon's foresight resembles hindsight. But not even, Nick, not even Nielsen, did I say Nixon? Not even Nielsen could have predicted how long and how devastating that war would be. Some did anticipate what might occur. Viscount Gray of Falladon, Foreign Secretary till 1916 said, the lights are going out all over Europe and we shall not see them come back in our lifetime. The opinion of the man in the street I heard in 1938 from a man named Max Brower, who was the mayor of Hamburg in 1938. Mr. Brower came to Berkeley. I had occasion to drive him around to some speaking engagements. I recall him saying, we all thought we would be back home by Christmas. That is, in four months. Well, the war dragged on for four dreadful years and more. During the latter period of the war, a young, a youngish high school teacher began to write a book. Volume one appeared in 1918, volume two in 1922. In 1926, New York publisher Alfred Knopf brought out the two volumes of The Decline of the West. It was not easy reading. Its thesis was somewhat dubious, but it was probably the most talked about and the most written about book of the 1920s and 1930s. Spengler's overwrought book seemed to say to the readers of it what many felt in their bones, that Western civilization was doomed, kaput, 
Now, Spengler despised the Nazis. He had no use for communism. But his book, his devaluation of the West, added fuel to Soviet expansionism by making it appear that some kind of Marxism was the only viable alternative now that the West was sinking below the horizon. Well, where do we stand today? Well, first of all, Cardinal Newman's panegyric to Western civilization was somewhat overblown, overstated. There were and are, we now know, great civilizations on other continents, civilizations which merit our respect. That's the first point. The second is to emphasize that Western civilization is our civilization, and only persons firmly rooted in their native habitat can come to a proper appreciation of other civilizations and other cultures. Those who are alienated from their own civilization, from their native soil, fall prey to charlatans. We have recently witnessed the spectacle a few miles south of here of a grubby, turbaned clown who would be ridiculed by genuine Hindu scholars conning gullible Americans into parting with their money and with whatever wits they were presumed to have in order to grovel at this guy's feet. Hinduism is good, but fake Hinduism is a bad joke. And of course, so is fake Christianity, as we have learned from several egregious examples in recent months. In any event, the liberal arts curriculum has been the educational scheme of Western civilization and will be again. A civilization like ours still has untapped, unutilized powers of recovery and regeneration, as the story is told in some of the books I have listed in this special bibliography. It has been said by Lowell Lawrence, president of Harvard back in the 1920s, that no civilization has ever been murdered. It's always suicide. No civilization has ever been destroyed from without until it has first crumbled from within. But a civilization which responds vigorously to challenges from within or from without may renew itself. It all depends on the kind of people who compose that civilization. In other words, the fate of our society or of our civilization depends on us and on people like us. And one thing we do know, we, each of us, we can work on ourselves. It was a set of ideas something like these which inspired Leonard Reed more than 42 years ago. Nothing like cold coffee. Uh, <laughs> inspired Reed to set up the foundation for economic education as a sort of a venture in adult education. The American nation during the 40s and earlier had lapsed into a New Deal type of socialism. Why? Because this country's citizens had failed for several generations earlier to educate themselves in the freedom philosophy, the opposite of socialism. The beliefs which had inspired our 18th century forebears to set up the unique structure which characterized our nation, the basic political and economic structures, had declined. Likewise, the ethical and spiritual underpinnings of those ideas. And uh, during these decades when the freedom philosophy was in remission or in decline, the ideologues of socialism bombarded us with an unremitting campaign to persuade people that government could run things better than we could. In other words, the socialists, by writing lots of books and their other activities, manufactured a new public opinion. The new public opinion they manufactured was different from the original, and as a result of the inculcation of bad ideas from that source, 
we were saddled with numerous political interventions into every sector of our lives. The ideas by which we might have resisted these interventions had been put on the shelf. The suggested remedy uh, for the Foundation was twofold. First of all, try to arouse in people a renewed and a vigorous interest in knowing the requirements of freedom. And secondly, when this interest is aroused, have on hand to nourish it books, pamphlets, periodicals, speeches. Thus gradually, by each person educating himself, bad ideas would be driven out by being replaced by good ideas. And then, when the good ideas were in place, right action would follow. The Foundation emphasis was and is on self-education, which is the only kind of education there is. A wise and experienced teacher is one who has been over the route before. He has been exposed in a previous generation to the grand old fortifying classical curriculum, so he knows the material. He knows where the minefields are. He knows which roads are blind, blind alleys and which are dead ends. But there's one thing even the best teacher cannot do. He cannot educate you. You have to educate yourself. Educate is not a transitive verb. Educate is not what anyone can do to another or for another, but anyone with the incentive can do it for himself. And now for some practical advice, by which I guarantee that you can upgrade your marks. This idea of self-education I came across in sort of a playful way in a book by Arnold Bennett, the well-known British novelist. It's on your list. The pamphlet was written maybe about 1912, called How to Live on 24 Hours a Day. And he constructs a kind of a humorous dialogue between himself and someone who doesn't agree with this when Bennett says, I can change your life. Give me 90 minutes, three evenings a week, and I can transform you. A bit of a humorous dialogue about this, and finally Bennett convinces this person to give it a try. 90 minutes, three times a week of intense study. Now, this does not mean merely sitting down with a book in front of you. That's where you start. You start picking out some topic, a subject of your own choice. Maybe political economy, one of the books you'll pick up here. Start somewhere. Select some topic for study, get a book, and begin to read. Well, Bennett says, you'll start to read, and after a few minutes, your mind will be in Seattle or in New York or miles away. Grab your mind by the scruff of the neck and bring it back, says Bennett. And gradually, your mind will realize who's in charge and begin to obey you as soon as it knows that you mean business. At this point, your mind will start to pay attention and do what you demand of it. There's another little gadget I picked up somewhere else. Every evening before retiring, rehearse the events of the day. What was it like outside when you first got out of bed? What did you have for breakfast? What did you do during the day? Whom did you meet? And so on. Now, once your mind realizes that it will be called upon to recite at the end of the day, it'll start paying attention. You will begin you'll begin to experience the events of the day more vividly, and you will remember them, or your mind will. Leonard Reed kept a journal. And this is a, an, an extra little chore added on to simply recalling the events. Write them out. Every day for maybe 20 or 30 years, Leonard kept the journal. We have them stretched on a shelf. They were bound, uh, maybe about 10 feet long. We wrote a lot. Keep a journal, a good idea. If you can't get around to keeping a journal, take notes on what you read. Keep a card file box. Type or write quotations that appeal to you, or ideas, and try to get them in, whether in the A thing or whatever. I've never learned to file 
I filed some things by the author's names and some things by the topic, but I, I manage. Also, I would recommend read the books you own. You'll need to own some good books. If you own the book, read the book with a red pencil. Put a check mark beside something that strikes your fancy. If there's some especially quotable sentence or something significant, underline it. If there is something you want to also remember, but it is not quotable, say, but just the gist of what the author is driving at, put a parenthesis around a sentence or around a paragraph. Mark your books in red. When you do that, the mere marking will begin to drive the point home to you, and then next year you want to review the book, you go through it very rapidly. If you are taking a textbook course, I started the practice at one point in college of preparing a regular outline of the chapter, you know, Roman numeral one, uh, capital letter A, subheading one, sub-subheading, little a, and so on. Outline the chapter which will fix it in your mind, and I guarantee that if you are tested on that chapter or section, you will do a better job than you maybe have done before. Liberal arts education requires reading. And reading requires seeing. Now you think that seeing is a purely natural activity. Not quite. The great English novelist and essayist who died 25 years ago, 20 years ago, I guess, had a serious eye disease which left him with exceedingly poor vision. If you saw early photographs of him, his lenses were looked like half an inch thick. Aldous Huxley took the Bates training method of eye improvement with uh, someone, a practitioner in Los Angeles, wrote a book called The Art of Seeing on the Bates method of eye training plus a lot more. Um, I, I was fitted with glasses when I was about 28. I didn't greatly need them, but my eyes were bothering a bit. So I got glasses. They were a nuisance. I disliked them. I got a hold of Aldous Huxley's book, put aside the glasses, and didn't get glasses until 15 years later. I wear them now. So get a hold of Huxley's Art of Seeing, read it. When you've read that, read the next book, Walter B. Pitkin's The Art of Rapid Reading, which I picked up sometime during my high school or college years. Pitkin was a professor at Columbia, professor of philosophy, wrote a number of popular books, one of them Life Begins at 40. Remember that one? The Art of Rapid Reading. Now, I suppose that there are advances on this at the present time. Ethel, Evelyn Woods has a program that you can take and pay a lot of money for. I don't know how helpful it is. I know that this book will work. It'll teach you to read faster, better, with greater ease and enjoyment, and with more comprehension. A few little things that you can practice. Uh, one of the things in the book was uh, trying to increase your peripheral vision. I didn't get this done from Pitkin, but from some other source. Someone said, learn to juggle three tennis balls. Not very difficult. This is called the fountain when you do it two hands. You juggle three tennis balls, learn to do it pretty readily. Then put a book up on a music rack. And while you are juggling, read the book. It is not as difficult as you think it is. It'll give you, you can see out of the corner of your eye now, it'll widen the corners. Well, now that you have, by these practices, this training, awakened a few billion brain cells and pumped some information into them, your mind will get restless. You'll begin to churn out ideas. That is, you'll be thinking lots of new and exciting thoughts. What is thinking like? I have a book in the bibliography, one of the finest in education, Jacques Barzoum, a famous professor at Columbia, magnificent person, teacher in America. Read it. Toward the end, there's this passage. It says Jacques Barzoum, a first-rate thinker, thinking is inwardly a haphazard, fitful, incoherent activity. If you could peer in and see thinking going on, it would not look like that trimmed and barbed result, a thought. 
Thinking is messy, repetitious, silly, obtuse, subject to explosions that shatter the crucible and leave darkness behind. Then comes another flash. A new path is seen, trod, lost, broken off, and blazed anew. It leaves the thinker dizzy as well as doubtful. He does not know what he thinks until he has thought it, or better, until he has written and riddled it with persistence akin to obsession. Now, when you do get hooked on thinking, you'll be irresistibly drawn into writing. And you'll discover very quickly that almost no author has ever relied wholly on the contents of his own mind. Every thinker and writer knows that he has to use reference books and conduct research. I never learned this or get any idea of this in college or graduate school, how to conduct research. There's an excellent book, Barzun and a, and a colleague, de Graff, The Modern Researcher. It's a book that's fun to read, but very, very useful. But then you can't stop there with the research. You've got to, light, you've got to be able to write passable English prose. And the best book on writing that I know of is, again, Barzun, Simple and Direct. That's his label for a particular style. And if you want to know how the ancient Greeks went about putting your thoughts into persuasive words, get hold of Aristotle's rhetoric. Now, this is not difficult reading. This is kind of a, of a fun book that Aristotle wrote about all kinds of uh, ways of framing your speeches depending upon the circumstances under which you will deliver it. Well, the human person is emphatically not the mere accidental end result of chance interactions of physical and chemical forces, no matter how much it may delight some of our contemporaries to think this. Nor is man some untidy excrescence tossed up between the last two ice ages by the same forces which rust iron and ripen corn. To the contrary, Every man and woman is a work of divine art. Through our being flow the creative forces of the universe. If we learn to coordinate with those forces, then we become creators also. Some of us in a small degree, others in a large degree. As a matter of fact, novelty, something new, comes onto the cosmic scene every time any one of you thinks a thought. The future is not fixed, it is in the making right now, and there's no action we take that does not affect the future one way or another. The future is in our hands, and this is a responsibility we cannot possibly avoid. Even if we do nothing, the future inexorably records our inaction and is different than it would be if we had done something. Center of human creativity is the individual man or woman, the individual human mind. And the creative process in thought, in literature, music and art is written up in some of the materials in the first section of the herd bibliography. Well, to sum up, I've had some things to say about the ages-old liberal arts curriculum as an essential element of Western civilization. But now that we know something about the other great world civilizations, we realize that we can learn from them, but only if we retain a firm hold on our own heritage. I have pointed out that education is not at all the same thing as schooling, and I have argued that education and training are not the same. Although within the classical liberal arts tradition, there was training to the extent that that tradition manufactured the tools of learning. The tools you need if you are to perform the necessary act of self-education. Education deals with ideas. Ideas rule the world, and nothing is, Victor Hugo said, nothing is so powerful as an idea whose time has come. 
the man or woman who thinks has an unmeasurable influence upon those who come into contact with him or her. And by his thoughtful actions, each of us exerts leverage over the future. Albert J. Nock was a product of the grand old fortifying classical curriculum. And it's fairly safe to refer to Nock as probably the most explicitly educated man in America during the first third of this century. However, Nock thought of himself in this culture as a superfluous man. Well, it is certainly true that a classical education will not make you the life of the party. It will not elevate you into the rich and the famous. It might even make you superfluous, but the fun is in the going. Where you get is another question. Self-education, then, is a never-ending series of challenges, and each challenge overcome confronts us not with peace, but with a further challenge and a broader horizon. But that's what life is all about. I'll say one thing for such a life, it is never dull. Thank you.